Hello, and welcome to Session 4 of the Basic Tax Course. We're going to begin Session 4 with a review of the Session 2 Quiz Answer Key. In preparing for this review, you should have open in front of you a copy of the Session 2 Quiz, a copy of the Session 2 Quiz Answer Key, which you can access and print from the materials page for Session 4, as well as Pub 17. This is the Quiz Answer Key for Session 2, and this is the quiz. I'll be flipping between them and reading most. I will be flipping between them and reading mainly from the quiz itself because that's kind of how I think. I just answer the problems in turn, but every once in a while I might say, hey, let's go look at the quiz answer key and say what it says. Now, beginning with today's class, the quiz review will only include a review of the questions that I feel are the most relevant or were the most frequently missed. And the first most frequently missed question that we will cover in session two is question number three. Mr. H died in early 2011. Mrs. H remarried in November of 2011 and therefore is unable to file a joint return with Mr. H. What is the filing status of the decedent, Mr. H? It is a rare situation where you would have a widow remarry in the same year as the date of death of her husband, but it is technically possible. And when that happens, she is now the spouse of her new husband. And they will either file jointly or separately, but she will no longer be eligible to file jointly with her deceased husband. So the only possible answer for the deceased husband as far as filing statuses go is married filing separate. Clearly he was not single when he died, and there was no divorce, so uh, his filing status choice would be left with married filing separate. Mr. H was married on the date he died, so he's considered married for the entire year and must file as married. Since Mrs. H has remarried, Mr. H cannot file jointly with her, and therefore the only status choice available to him is married filing separate. The next question we will review is question number five. To file using the head of household filing status, the taxpayer must always be able to claim at least one dependency exemption. And that statement is false. We have repeatedly discussed the situation where you can have a parent uh, of a child who has released the dependency exemption of that child to the non-custodial parent. And when that happens, the custodial parent is able to file as head of household, assuming they meet all of the tests for head of household, without claiming the dependency exemption for that child. Again, you can refer to Table 2.1 in Publication 17. If the qualifying person is your unmarried qualifying child, that person does not need to be your dependent. So let's just go take a look at Pub 17 together. Again, I am on table 2.1. Who is a qualifying person qualifying you to file as head of household? I'm interested in this box right here. If the person is your qualifying child, such as your son, daughter, or grandchild who lived with you for more than half of the year and meets certain other tests, and he or she is single, then this person is a qualifying person whether or not you can claim an exemption for the person. So that is the one situation where you don't have to have a qualifying person uh, claimed as a dependent to give you that head of household filing status. The next question in line that I'm going to look at is question number eight. Mrs. Setter was divorced in February 1, 2011. She had a 12-year-old dependent daughter living with her in her home for the entire year. It cost $8,000 to maintain Mrs. Setter's home for the year. Mrs. Setter paid $5,000 towards the support of her household. Her ex-husband provided $3,000 in support payments towards the household. According to their divorce decree, Mrs. Setter's ex-husband is entitled to claim their daughter's dependency exemption. What is the most advantageous filing status Mrs. Setter can qualify for? And the answer is head of household. Mrs. Setter, again, does not need to claim her daughter as a dependent to qualify as head of household. Again, refer to page 24, table 2.1 or 2-1 of Pub 17 that I did just finish showing you. Moving over to question number 10. Tracy was widowed in 2010. In 2011, she paid more than half the cost of keeping up her home for the year. 
Tracy also paid more than half the cost of supporting her 12-year-old cousin, Mike, who lived with her from February through December. What is the most advantageous filing status that Tracy can legally claim? Well, the answer is, unfortunately for Tracy, she's stuck with single. She's widowed. She did pay more than half the cost of keeping up her home for the year. And she paid more than half the cost of supporting her 12-year-old son, cousin. And she paid more than half the cost of supporting her 12-year-old cousin. But that's where the problem is. We have to really put a big circle around cousin. Because a cousin does not meet the relationship test. A cousin cannot qualify you as head of household. And therefore, Tracy is only single. It would be no different if she had supported a boyfriend than the cousin. In order to be head of household, you have to keep up a household for a person who is related to you. A cousin does not meet the definition of related in this case. Number 16, Mr. and Mrs. Black are filing a joint return, and during the year they provided more than 50% of the support for the following individuals, all of whom are U.S. citizens. Uh, there are a total of one, two, three, four, five people that we have to consider. And then the wording of the problem says, how many exemptions can Mr. and Mrs. Black claim on their return? Well, this is a question that says, how many exemptions? That means we're looking for the number of dependents plus the taxpayers themselves. We're already at two, just with Mr. and Mrs. Black. So we're looking at how many dependents are going to add to that. Let's just take each dependent in turn. The black single daughter, age 21, was a full-time student for six months. During the summer, she earned $3,700, which was spent on her support. Can we claim the black's daughter? Well, let's look. She's age 21. She's a full-time student for six months. She needs to be a full-time student for five or more months for the gross income test to get thrown out, and she was. So we don't look at the gross income test at all. She passes the support test. She passes the relationship test. She passes the U.S. citizen test. Yes, the daughter is in. Then we move on to Mrs. Black's cousin, age 12, who lived with them from May through December. Well, since Mrs. Black's cousin does not meet the relationship test, she must have been a member of the household for the entire year. May through December is not the entire year, so the cousin is out. Mrs. Black's widowed father, age 72, lived with them the full year. He had gross income of 3750 Well, since the widowed father is not a qualifying child, we move over to the qualifying relative tests. And under the qualifying relative test, he must pass the gross income test. The gross income test says if his income is $3,700 or more, he cannot be a qualifying relative, and uh, that is the case. His income is more than $3,700. He therefore fails the gross income test. He is out. Next in line, we have Mrs. Black's widowed mother, age 69. She lived alone, and her sole source of income was Social Security of $3,000. Well, she lives alone, she meets the relationship test, she is a U.S. citizen or resident. Her sole source of income is Social Security, $3,000. She's going to pass the gross income test. She's in. We've got her. And then we've got the Black's legally adopted daughter, age 5, who lived with them from February through December. Well, She's legally adopted, so she's considered to be their child now. She is related to them, therefore she doesn't need to live with them at all to qualify as an exemption for dependency purposes. So the, do the adopted daughter is in. So we have Mrs. Black, Mr. Black, the Black single daughter, the adopted daughter, and the widowed mother. That's a total of five. That makes C number five, or C5 is the correct answer. Number 17, Joan paid more than 50% of the support for her daughter, Judy, age 24. Judy was a full-time student and earned $3,700. Joan can claim her daughter as a dependent. That is a false statement. The reason it's false is the child is no longer under the age of 24. She is therefore not a qualifying child. We move over to the qualifying relative test. Under the qualifying relative test, she must pass the gross income test by having less than $3,700 of income. $3,700 is not less than $3,700, therefore she fails the test. Number 20, a taxpayer's spouse may never be claimed as a dependent by the taxpayer. That is a true statement. It's kind of a, what's the point of its statement? So I'm going to spend a little bit of time looking at Form 1040 and explaining this to you a little bit. 
So I wanted to draw your attention to Form 1040 here. When we look at 1040, there is a space to enter your name. There's a place to enter your spouse's name. There is a space to enter the names and social security numbers and relationships of your dependents. While it is possible to claim in rare situations an exemption for your spouse on your married filing separate return, you would never claim the exemption for your spouse by listing your spouse as a dependent in the dependents section. So the only place a spouse is ever listed is in the spouse section on the return, unless of course your spouse is filing as a taxpayer and then you're listed as the spouse. But married couples only ever put their names and social security numbers up here. When we get down to exemptions, it is possible to enter an exemption for yourself and a separate exemption for your spouse on lines 6A and 6B so that you could then enter a total of two over on that line. The total of uh, lines 6A and 6B would be two if you were to check both those boxes. And it is possible to select both of those boxes and check both of, both of those boxes on a married filing separate return if your spouse has no gross income of their own. Um, but again, you're claiming the spouse's exemption. You are not claiming your spouse as a dependent. And the next question we're going to review is question number 23. Which of the following is not considered to be gross income when figuring the gross income test? Social security benefits, scholarships used for tuition fees and books by a degree candidate, wages earned by your minor child, or scholarships received by a degree candidate that are used to pay for student housing? Well, the correct answer is E. Let's look in the answer key, number 23. Social security benefits generally do not factor into gross income. There is an exception when taxable Social Security benefits are looked into because taxable Social Security certainly is a factor in the gross income test. However, Social Security will generally only become income when one half of Social Security benefits plus other sources of income to the dependents exceeds $25,000. This topic is covered in greater detail when we get to Session 5 of our course uh, where we will cover Social Security income. Then we also look at scholarships received by a degree candidate that are spent on tuition, fees, book supplies, and equipment. These amounts are not taxable and are not a factor in the gross income test. For more information on the definition of gross income, you should go to Pub 17, page 32 for gross income defined. If your child who was under age 19 has not passed the test for qualifying child and you are applying the test for qualifying relative, then their wages would be included in the gross income test. So this is a question about gross income. Normally your child's income is not a factor in the gross income test, but if your child is not a qualifying child, um, then you would look at, well, and if they are a minor child, then <laughs> wages are not a consideration for gross income at all. Moving on to number 24, Social Security received by a child from the account of his deceased father and used for the child's support is considered to be support provided by the child. This is another one where we really do need to take a look at Pub 17 together. So let's go to page 33 of Pub 17 and look at Social Security benefits. And I've drawn an arrow ahead of time right here, Social Security benefits. There's a couple of items to look at here. If a husband and wife each receive benefits that are paid by one check made out to both of them, half of the total paid is considered to be for the support of each spouse unless they can show otherwise. If a child receives Social Security benefits and uses them towards his or her own support, these benefits are considered to be support provided by the child. And that is where number 24 gets the correct answer as item number B. Number 25, this is another one of those lengthy questions where you're asked to analyze multiple scenarios. The Mitchells are filing a joint return. They have two children, Mary Lou, age 8, and Susie, age 21. Mary Lou lived at home all year and was supported by the Mitchells. Susie is a full-time student at Oregon State University and earned $4,200 for the year. Susie also received a non-taxable scholarship valued at $4,000. The Mitchells provided $4,500 towards Susie's support. So let's just look at this one paragraph first to see whether there's any dependents up here. And you can see I've highlighted in green that Susie and Mary Lou will both qualify. It's easy to see Mary Lou why. She's age 8. She's their kid. It's not hard to imagine her meeting all of the qualifying child tests. 
Susie is age 21, and therefore we're looking to make sure of two points. One is that she is a full-time student, and she is. We say that in the wording of the problem. The second one is that Susie is not providing more than half of her own support. So we look at a couple of different figures coming in here. She works full-time and received $4,200. She also received a scholarship valued at $4,000, and the Mitchells provided $4,500 towards Susie's support. So the $4,000 scholarship is not factored into the support test at all. It is not considered to be provided by Susie or her parents. It's just kind of there, off there on the side. Then we look at how much support was provided by her parents, how much was provided by Susie. We can see that Susie provided less than half, and therefore she is a dependent. So we get a yes for Susie, and we get a yes for Mary Lou. Next paragraph. The Mitchells contributed $3,000 to the support of Mrs. Mitchell's divorced mother, Mrs. Bedford, who is age 65 and lived in her own apartment. Mrs. Bedford's personal income was $3,700, of which $1,900 was Social Security benefit. Mrs. Mitchell's mother spent all of her income on her own support. Well, here's what we're getting at now. We have to look at how much support was provided by the Mitchells, in this case, 3,000. We then look at how much support was provided by Mrs. Bedford. Well, Mrs. Bedford provided $3,700 of support to herself. Therefore, uh, the Mitchells cannot say they paid more than half, and Mrs. Bedford fails the uh, support test. The gross income test, although it may appear to be a factor, is not actually a factor. Social Security benefits uh, subtracted out from the other income that she had would not leave her in a situation for where she's failing the support to, or the gross income test. Under the gross income test, you, fit, you look at all kinds of income, but you don't factor in Social Security income to the gross income test. So if you were to tra subtract 1900 from 3700 the resulting number is obviously less than 3700 So in terms of the gross income test, Mrs. Bedford did pass that. It's the support test that she failed. So therefore, we look down at the number of exemptions again that the Mitchells are able to claim. There's one for Mrs. Mitchell, there's one for Mr. Mitchell, there's one for Susie, and there's one for Mary Lou. That's a total of four. The correct answer is four. Number 26. Jenna Simmons, who is single and lives alone, has no other income of her own and is supported in full by the following persons. This is a really tricky question. It's one that I know has come up on the Oregon exams. Um, but let's take a look at it. Alma, an unrelated friend, provided 48% of the support for Jenna. We also have Ben, who is Jenna's brother, providing 43% of the support, and Carl, who is Jenna's son, providing 9% of the support. For the multiple support agreement, under a multiple support agreement, it is possible for a person who provided less than half of a person's total support to claim that person as a dependent, provided they pass every test except the support test, and it can be shown that more than half of the support was provided by people who also pass all of the de dependency tests except the support test. And in this case, who passes every test except the support test? Well, the answer is both Ben and Carl do. Ben is related, and uh, he contributed support. And because he's related, he doesn't have to live with his sister. Carl is related in that he is a son, so he doesn't need to live with his mother. So these two are, are doing fine. Alma is the problem, and the reason Alma is a problem is she's not related. And because she's not related, it means that in order to claim Jenna as a dependent, Alma and Jenna would need to live together for the entire year as members of the same household. Well, we're telling you that Jenna Simmons lives alone. Therefore, Alma did not live with her. And since Alma did not live with her, even though she provided 48% of the support, Alma is out, and no, amount, no dependency exemption can apply to Alma or be given to Alma. Also, for Carl, we have a problem in that the dependency exemption can only be awarded under a multiple support agreement to an individual who provided more than 10% of the support. Since Carl provided only nine, he is not able to claim the dependency exemption for Jenna. That leaves the only person allowed to claim the exemption being Ben. So that makes C the correct answer. And that concludes the review of the Session 2 Quiz Answer Key. It is now time to review the Session 3 Homework Assignment. Session 4, password number 1 is... Bay, B-A-Y.
And I have now up in front of you the answer key for the Session 3 homework assignment. And before I start reviewing it with you, let's just take a look again at the problem itself. Jackie Rhodes, we're preparing a tax return for her. We need to prepare Forms 1040 and Form 4137. She lives in Portland, Oregon. She is a qualifying widow. Her husband died in 2010, and she is not remarried. She has two children whom she supports. They lived with her all year. Uh, so she's going to meet those tests for qualifying widow with dependent child. That will help her out on her taxes. She also received a 1099 INT from First National Bank, Box 1 interest of 100 Box 3 interest of 300 Box 8 interest of $300. Again, it's your job as a tax preparer to know what those boxes mean. Box 1 means ordinary interest. It is taxable on the federal return. Box 3 means U.S. bond interest, which is also taxable on the federal return. And Box 8 interest is tax-exempt interest. It is not generally taxable on the federal return, but it is still entered on line 8B of Form 1040. Jackie is a teacher. She is also a server on the weekends at Alice's Bar and Grill. She did not report tips to her employers and did not keep a tip record, so that's why 4137 is required. Her W-2s are attached. And they're shown right there. So let's take a look at this answer key. And it starts off by saying that since Jackie's husband died in 2010, Jackie will check box 5 under filing status and enter her husband's year of death, which is 2010, in the space provided. Jackie has two dependent children, and her husband died in one of the preceding two years. That's why she gets the status qualifying widow with dependent child. In addition, both of her children are under age 17, and they qualify her for the child tax credit. Here is Jackie's Form 1040. We've checked the qualifying widow or widower with dependent child and entered the year of death of the spouse. The number of exemptions being claimed for the taxpayer is one. She does not get to claim a, uh, an exemption for her deceased spouse. She does enter the names of both of her children. Uh, she has a daughter and a nephew living with her, both of whom qualify her for the child tax credit. We've entered two children living with her or two qualifying children living with her and a total of three exemptions for the year. Next on line seven, we take the total wages reported in box one of the Board of Education W-2, that's 42,000. To that, we add $1,750 of wage income from Alice's Bar and Grill plus another $1,275 of tip income to get the total of $45,025 that we need to enter on line 7. On line 8, we enter the interest income that was received. We had interest of $100 in box 3, or we had interest of $100 in box 1 and $300 of interest in box 3. That is a total of $400 to enter on line 8A. And box 8 interest was $300 we will carry that over and enter it on line 8B. That's the only income that Jackie had for the year, so we're essentially done with figuring her income. We add those two lines up and we get $45,425. That is also her adjusted gross income. Time to move over to page two. On page two, qualifying widow is allowed to claim the same standard deduction as married filing joint. So that $11,600 figure will carry over to line 40. We subtract 11600 from Jackie's adjusted gross income. We get 33825 Next, we look at the number of exemptions she's allowed to claim. She's allowed one for herself plus one for each of her two qualifying children. That's a total of three. Three times 3700 is $11,100. We subtract that amount from the amount on line 41, and we're left with taxable income on line 43 of $22,725. The next thing that Jackie needs to do is go to the tax tables in Pub 17 to look up the tax. She will use the married filing joint table and the t amount that she will get by using the married filing joint table on 22725 of taxable income is $2,559. She's allowed a $1,000 child tax credit for each of the two qualifying children because each of those children is under age 17 and lived with her for more than half the year. 
That $2,000 is a big break on her taxes. It reduces her tax bill from $2,559 down to only $559. But we're not done figuring her tax. She does need to complete Form 4137, so let's go do that now. And here we are on Form 4137. The starting point is to look at the total cash and charge tips that you received. The only amount of tips that is showing on the W-2 at all is allocated tips. You can see there are no Social Security tips reported in Box 7, only allocated tips in Box 8. So that's the total that's going to carry over and enter it in Column C. There's no amount that was reported to the employer for the year. Her total income to enter on line 8 is $43,750. That's clearly less than $106,800. That total of $4,375 is $42 plus $1,750. Uh, and that's where we get the $43,750. If the amount on line 8 is more than the amount on line 7, then she would not need to pay Social Security tax portion. But obviously it's less, so she does. We're going to take 1275, multiply that by 0 0.042 to arrive at the amount of Social Security tax she owes. We're going to multiply it by 0 0.0145 to arrive at the amount of Medicare tax that she owes, which is $18. We add 54 plus 18 and we get $72. That $72 is the tax on her TIP income. She's going to go and enter that on line 57 of the Form 1040 and add that to the $559 amount showing on line 55. So Jackie Rhodes' total tax owed for this year is $631. She had $3,500 withheld on her W-2. That's clearly more than her tax, so she's left with a refund of $2,869. So that concludes the review of the Session 3 homework assignment. It is now time to push pause on video playback. Go to the Assignments page and complete the Session 3 quiz. So go to the Assignment page for Session 4, complete the Session 3 quiz. When you are ready, resume video playback for the Session 4 lecture. So I've, the next point that we're going to talk about is that TD form, that TDF 9022.1. Beginning in 2011, there are now two reporting requirements for individuals who hold control over foreign bank account or investment accounts. Individuals with more than $10,000 in foreign accounts must file form TD 9022.1 by June 30th of each year. Beginning in 2011, Section 511 requires any individual who holds more than 50000 in a depository or custodial account maintained by a foreign financial institution to report that account. So it's possible that you will have a client that has to file both these returns every year from now on for as long as they have $50,000 in financial accounts outside of the United States. If they have less than 50, but they have 10000 or more, they're going to have to file the one form, TD 9022.1. Now, this, the new requirement, this $50,000 requirement that requires attaching a form to the return, that form is actually attached to the 1040 and becomes a part of the filed tax return. But the TD form 9022.1, which is referred to as the FBAR report, FBAR being F-B-A-R, Report of Foreign Financial Accounts, that is actually mailed to Detroit, Michigan and it has a due date of June 30th each year. So there's a question in the, audio, the classroom here, are the earnings that good on these foreign bank accounts? This is not about the earnings per se. It's about whether or not the earnings are being disclosed and reported on US tax returns. And for many, many years, it's, you've probably heard all the stories, yeah, I've got uh, undisclosed bank accounts in the Cayman Islands or in Switzerland. They've got all these secrecy laws so rich billionaires can hide their money there and not pay tax on it. And well, the government has not been able to control that much until recently. And the United States government has gotten really assertively aggressive at a diplomatic level in forcing the foreign governments to force these banks to release information about American citizens and residents who have money in them. And now the IRS is using information coming from those foreign countries, those foreign financial institutions, to look to see if the income has been reported on U.S. tax returns. And if you haven't reported it, you are in such big trouble you don't know it. 
well, a lot of these people do know that they're in trouble and they're afraid to reveal it. I, there's been a couple of amnesties that have happened over the last few years because the IRS has been giving people the opportunity to come forward and voluntarily disclose these offshore hidden accounts. Um, and the amnesties have brought a number of panicked people into my office. And last year, as an amnesty was ending in August, I had a flurry of phone calls coming into my office from Canada. Now, why from Canada? Well, there were some television commercials running in Canada notifying Americans in Canada that if they had bank accounts in Canada and they hadn't been filing these FBAR reports, they could be in really big trouble and they needed to take action by August 31. And what many Americans living in Canada and other countries were figuring out is that they actually had a filing requirement at all. That they may have lived in Canada or Australia or New Zealand or England or some other foreign country for virtually their entire lives. They may never have stepped foot in the United States because they were born in a foreign country, but they were born to American citizens. And so um, some of them were born in the United States and left when they were three. Others were born overseas to American citizens, and they never even knew they had a filing requirement until some, until some of the stuff started playing in the foreign press. And so a number of Canadians were finding about our company and calling us in a panic over this amnesty. In the end, all they did was waste our, our time. <laughs> but the number of phone calls was rather interesting. So how does this FBAR report work? Well, on the FBAR report, you need to report your foreign financial accounts. And you need to report the name of the bank that you have an account with, the address of the bank, the account number you have with that bank, and the maximum value of that account at the high point during the year. And if you have multiple accounts, you have to list every single account, the maximum balance in every single account, the address and account number of all of the accounts. If any of your accounts are joint, as in a husband and wife, if either of you individually meets the filing requirement, then both of you have to file FBAR reports reporting the same money in the same accounts if they're joint accounts. There's no such thing as a joint FBAR report. Now, what happens if you're required to file the FBAR report and you don't? Well, you can be subject to penalties. And these are not new penalties. It's just that IRS is on a new mission of enforcement. And uh, so when we get to that point on the Schedule D where you have to check the box, do I have a foreign financial account, you're going to turn to your client and say, do you have any financial accounts or bank accounts outside of the United States? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, then the next question is, was the maximum value in all of your accounts combined at the high point during the year $10,000 or higher? If the answer is yes, it was, they're required to file FBAR. And if they fail to file FBAR, these are the potential penalties. Negligent violation, up to $500. Non-willful violation, up to $10,000 for each negligent violation. Pattern of negligent activity. In addition to a penalty under Section 5321 with respect to any such violation, but not more than $50,000. Willful failure to file the FBAR report up to the greater of $100,000 or 50% of the amount in the account at the time of the violation. So if you have $2 million overseas in a foreign financial account, the IRS could technically take half of it, a full million, because you failed to report the account on an FBAR. Um, willful failure to file FBAR or retain records of account while violating certain other laws, such as, for example, I am a U.S. citizen and I'm required to report my worldwide income and I haven't told the IRS that I have $100 million in a Swiss bank account and I've never filed or repaid any tax on my income in that Swiss bank account. Again, the greater of $100,000 or 50% of the amount in the account at the time of the violation. Knowingly and willfully filing a false FBAR report up to the greater of $100,000 or 50% of the amount in the account at the time of the violation and of course, there's criminal penalties that swing into effect on these final three categories, up to $250,000 criminal penalty, five years or both, up to a $500,000 penalty, 10 years or both, and 10,000 or five uh, years or both. So that's, they're talking prison time here <laughs> for failure to report these overseas financial accounts. And there is a Q&A section on the IRS's website. 
This is the link for it right here. If you want to go read more about FBAR, there's a whole page with multiple links where you can read all about it. FBAR is a multi-page form. I'm just going to show you the front page of it. And the starting point is to identify yourself as an individual because these rules also apply to partnerships and corporations, et cetera. And you'll see it provides a place to enter your name and your address and your social security number. And then it starts to ask for information about the account. Remember I told you that you want to, they'll want to know the amount you had in the account? The maximum value of the account during the year. So if you had $50,000 in the account for a single day, and it was only one day, but it was in that account on that day, you have to file the report. So for example, we had a client who had a house in England. They sold the house. The money from the sale of the house was deposited into their account in England for a couple, three days before it transferred out to accounts here in the United States. The FBAR report was required. Next up, we have the new form. The new form in the land is Form 8938, Statement of Specified Foreign Financial Accounts. And for tax years beginning after March 18, 2010, the IRS requires individuals to report certain financial assets if the value of these assets exceeds $50,000. Form 8938 is required to be filed in the following situations. You are a specified individual. And a specified individual is a US citizen or a resident alien of the United States for any part of the tax year, a non-resident alien who makes an election to be treated as a resident alien for purposes of filing a joint income tax return, a non-resident alien who is a bona fide resident of American Samoa or Puerto Rico, and you have interest in a specified foreign financial assets required to be reported. A specified foreign financial asset is any financial account maintained by a foreign financial institution, other financial assets held for investments that are not in an account main, maintained by a U.S. or foreign financial institution, such as stocks or securities issued by someone other than a U.S. person, any interest in a foreign entity, and any financial instrument or contact that has an issuer or counterparty that is not a U.S. person. So we're looking at the aggregate fair market value of all of your foreign assets combined, and if they go over 50000 you have to file the form. And uh, here, here's kind of a breakdown of how it works. 50000 is the starting point. If you are unmarried and on the last day of the year you are living inside of the United States uh, and you had on the last day of the year $50,000 in the account, then you're required to file. But you may have had less than 50000 in the account, but 75000 or more at some other point during the year, then you're going to be required to file. You'll notice that these filing requirements are higher if you are a taxpayer living abroad. So if you are living abroad, the amounts that you have in foreign financial accounts can be higher before you're required to file. And you'll also see that these limits for married filers are twice those of unmarried filers, and married filing separate is half that of joint. Now it does have a note here. If you do not, you do not have to file a federal tax return. That is, you don't meet the federal filing requirement for filing a federal tax return then even if you have money in these foreign financial accounts that exceeds the limits, they're not requiring you to file Form 8938. 8938 is specifically a form that is attached to the US 1040. And if you're not required to file the 1040, you don't have to attach the form. But of course, if you have enough income from these foreign financial accounts, that could trigger a filing requirement. And you are still required to file FBAR if you have over $10,000. Here is the Form 8938. There's a little bit more detail to what goes on with Form 8938. It is similar to FBAR in that it requires all of the same information, the type of account you had, the name of the bank, the amount that you had in the, the uh, bank account, or the other financial accounts that you had. But it also asks you to go down and list the maximum values you had in accounts with check boxes. It asks if you used a foreign currency exchange rate to convert the currency, in most cases, that would be yes. And then on page two, it asks you to identify the amount of income you had from these foreign financial accounts and how much of that income has been reported on which schedule and line of your 1040 form. So let's just suppose you have um, $100,000 in a Swiss bank account. And that Swiss bank account gave you $5,000 of interest income for the year. Well, the IRS is going to want to know the name of the Swiss account, the address of the Swiss account, and the Swiss account number. And then it's going to ask you to enter the $5,000 of interest income you received from that account on this line. 
And then it's going to say, what was reported, what schedule was it reported on? So it would, of course, go on Schedule B, and it would be entered on Line 1 of Schedule B, wouldn't it? And it would go on Form 1040 and be entered on Line 8A. So that information also has to be reported. Now, I did mention the, mention the amnesty program in 2009, and again in 2011, the IRS offered people with undisclosed income from offshore accounts an opportunity to participate in voluntary disclosure initiatives to design to bring offshore money back to the U.S. tax system and help people with undisclosed income from these hidden accounts get current with their taxes. Getting current was expensive. You had to come forward and disclose that you had this offshore account and that you had failed to report the income from it on your tax return. You had to amend tax returns going back in time eight years, and for each of those eight years, enter the income that had been left off and pay the tax, including penalties and interest, upon it. You then had to file the FBAR report and pay penalties associated with it. But the normal 15, the normal 50 percent, that is 5-0 penalty, was dropped to only 25 percent. So they were only going to take 25 percent of your holdings rather than half. But there were a number of, quite a good number of people who've come forward under that amnesty, and it worked well. So they decided in 2011 to have another amnesty, and that ended on August 31st. That amnesty had a, re, had a penalty of 27.5 percent rather than the former penalty of 25 percent. But some taxpayers with smaller accounts have a smaller penalty of only 12.5 percent. Remember, these penalties are associated with people who have basically been evading U.S. taxes willfully and knowingly. And in some cases, they may not have had a federal filing liability or realize that they had one, and so they're not willful. And in cases where it's not willful, you can ask for relief. No guarantee that you'll get it. But if you found out after living abroad for 20 years that, oh my gosh, the entire 20 years I've been overseas, I was required to file these tax returns. I didn't know it. I didn't know any better. No one told me. I was ignorant of all of this. You can ask for relief, and it may be granted. And of course, they're going to look at the facts and the circumstances of each individual taxpayer, see how much money they were earning, what the likelihood is that they could have known about the law. I mean, if you moved to Australia with your parents when you were 10 years old, you went to college in Australia, you learned what the Australian tax code works like, you have a job in Australia, you've got a family in Australia, and 20 years later you find out you should have been filing tax returns for the last 10 years. You know, is that willful violation? No. But if you have another individual who moves to Australia at the age of 40 and he is a millionaire and he pays high-end accountants to do his tax returns for him each year, what are the odds those accountants aren't familiar with these foreign laws and haven't mentioned them to him? So they're going to look at a lot of different things in coming up with these solutions. Okay, so that is the end of this section on uh, interest and dividends. We're up to the next break in our class today. Session four, password number two is black, B-L-A-C-K. Okay, so back again with our manual. And at the top of the page, we're talking about taxable refunds. So I've been in taxes. You've probably heard me mention a few times 20 years. It's kind of a landmark anniversary year for me. I entered the industry at the end of 1992, 1993 was my first tax season. So it's officially been 20 seasons for me that I've been in the industry. And I've supervised a lot of tax preparers. I started teaching tax school 10 years ago. Actually, September of 2001 was my first year teaching a basic tax course. So between teaching the basic tax course and supervising preparers, I can tell you that a lot of tax preparers manage to mess up this taxable refund issue all the time. So although I consider it to be so elementary, I'm still going to spend some time talking about it. Generally, when you receive a, t a state refund, it's taxable only if you had a tax benefit from deducting it in an earlier year. But what happens is some states will issue 1099 uh, G documents reporting a refund, and the tax preparer does not stop to think about whether or not that is actually taxable income, and reports it on the tax return when it is not taxable. 
So when we talk about taxability of refunds, including state income tax refunds, the most important rule we have to look at is the tax benefit rule. Because a refund is only taxable if you receive a refund of tax, which you took a tax benefit from by deducting it on your tax return. So there's two things that go on in that formula. One is, did I deduct it? And secondly, was there a benefit that I received when I deducted it? Because it's possible you claimed a deduction and there was no benefit from deducting it. There would be no benefit if you hadn't deducted it and your tax never changed. That could happen. Some people have so many deductions that they could leave off several and it wouldn't change anything. So the fact that you have claimed a deduction for something still doesn't mean that it's taxable. You have to be show, show A, that you did deduct it, and B, that you received a benefit when you did deduct it. Now, your federal tax refund is not taxable on your federal return. The federal government does not allow you to claim a deduction for federal taxes you paid, so it will never tax your federal refund. But in certain situations, your federal refund might be taxed by your state, and that would be up to the laws of your individual state. We're in the state of Oregon, which almost never taxes a federal refund, but there are certain situations where it will. And other states may have uh, laws that allow for deduction of federal income taxes, so that if any portion of them is refunded, that they could be taxed. And that would be a state-specific issue that you need to look into locally where you live and prepare taxes. Now, how do you determine if a state refund is taxable? Well, if you claimed a deduction on a prior year return for your taxes and you had taxes paid to the state that were either withheld in that year or that you had paid during that year for the state liability and then you deducted those on Schedule A, your state will probably issue you a 1099-G. But even if you didn't deduct them, your state will probably still issue a 1099-G and so it's the tax preparer's job to be able to identify whether or not a tax benefit was received. Now, there is a worksheet that the IRS provides for determining whether or not your state refund is ta um, taxable. However, I find that the worksheet is incomplete and you can't depend upon it. Recovery of mortgage interest and other deductible expenses. As with your state tax refund, you should claim a refund of expenses as income if you've previously derived a tax benefit by claiming that expense as a deduction on your tax return. Now, it's a pretty rare thing to receive a refund of mortgage interest, but it is possible. And what the IRS is saying is if you deduct mortgage interest on Schedule A and later some of it is refunded, you, re you claim that refund as income, which is n uh, not a terribly beneficial way for the treatment to work, but that's what they want you to do. Here's an example. You claim mortgage interest you paid as an itemized deduction on Schedule A, and in a later year you receive a refund from your mortgage company for overpayment of interest. You must include the refund as interest, uh, of interest as income on your tax return, and you should treat the refund of interest in the same way you treat all other taxable interest income. That is line 8A. Unemployment compensation is also reported on 1099-G. I've laid out a 1099-G here and I've put a taxable state refund and unemployment on the same 1099-G. Now that would never happen in the real world because unemployment would come on one 1099-G and state refund would be reported on a separate 1099-G. But I kind of wanted to highlight the fact that it's a, the 1099-G is used for both. And so we've got this sample taxpayer here who's ended up receiving both. And how would those income amounts, if they're taxable, carry to the 1040 form? So in this case, if you have unemployment compensation being reported on a 1099-G, that carries down to line 19 of your 1040 and is entered there. And if you have a taxable state refund being reported in box 2 of the 1099-G, that gets carried down and entered on line 10 of the 1040. Now there are some additional rules to know about unemployment. Generally, any unemployment you receive during the year is taxable. Um, your unemployment benefits that are taxable are reported on line 19 of your 1040. Now if during the year that you received unemployment benefits, you ended up repaying some or all of those benefits, the IRS wants you to enter the full benefits on the, t the dotted line and then enter the amount that you repaid and the total taxable benefits then in the taxable line space. If the amount that you repaid to unemployment is greater than the benefits received, then you claim the excess as an itemized deduction on Schedule A, line 23, if you're itemizing your deduction.
Next in line is alimony, also referred to as spousal support. Now for many years I did a tax return for a lady. Every year she came in and I asked her the same question, did you receive any alimony? And the answer was always no. Along about year number eight or nine, she turned to me and she said, is spousal support um, taxable? <laughs> so ever since that event, I've made a point of asking my clients, did you receive alimony or spousal support during the year? Couldn't fathom how she wouldn't figure spousal support was alimony, but it wasn't my place to criticize her. She, after all, was my customer, and customer service is my business. So my failure to communicate all possible definitions or phrases that describe alimony was a failure on my part. But anyway, she took complete responsibility for the omission and did not blame me for failing to word it better. And we merely omitted her tax returns and paid a bunch of back taxes. Now, uh, alimony, let's talk about alimony and when we have it and when we do not have it. If your former spouse pays you alimony under a divorce or separation instrument, you have to reclude all of the alimony you receive as income. And you report that on line 11 of your tax return. But alimony is only alimony if it meets the definition of alimony. And to be alimony, a payment must meet certain conditions. To determine if alimony payments you receive are taxable as alimony, all of the following rules must be met. Number one, the payments are required by a divorce or separation instrument. Number two, you cannot file a joint return with the spouse paying you alimony. The payment is in cash. Your divorce or separate maintenance decree does not state that the payment is not alimony. You and your former spouse who is paying the alimony do not share the same household. There is no liability to make any payment in the form of cash or property after the death of the recipient's spouse, and the payment is not treated as child support. You cannot report alimony you receive on Form 1040-EZ or 1040-A. It does trigger the long form. The next thing we have to look at is child support, because very often people are confused about whether or not they actually have alimony or child support. And of course, alimony is alimony if it meets all of these tests, one of which is that the payment is not treated as child support. So what does that mean? Well, it means that you can't disguise child support and call it alimony. And so we have to look at what the definition of child support is to identify whether al child support is in fact being called alimony when it's not. If your divorce instrument specifically designates that a payment is child support or treats the payment as child support, then it is not alimony. A payment is specifically designated as child support to the extent that the payment is reduced either by the happening of a contingency relating to your child, such as the child becomes employed, or dies, or leaves the household, leaves school, gets married, or reaches a specified age or income level, or happens at a time that can be clearly associated with the contingency. So let's just suppose, for example, you've got a divorce decree that states Jane will pay George alimony in the amount of $3,000 a month until June 30th, 2020. And it happens to be June 30th, 2020 is the date that Junior reaches age 18. That would be a date that surrounds a contingency or an event relating to a child. And so even though it says alimony, because it can be associated with the date that a child reached you know, majority age, then it would be deemed to be child support and not alimony, regardless of what it's called. So here are some more examples. Steve and Sandra Ballard are divorced. Sandra has custody of their two children. The divorce decree states that Steve shall pay Sandra $1,500 per month. The decree does not stipulate that any of the payment is contingent on either of the children, and that means the entire payment is considered to be alimony. Example number two, Jean's divorce decree states that her husband must pay the following monthly amounts, $600 of spousal support and $200 of child support for each of their two children. Jean must report $7,200 of spousal support as alimony on her tax return. Jean's former husband will be allowed to claim the $7,200 of alimony he pays as an adjustment on his return but the $4,800 of child support that Jean receives from her husband is not taxable to her, nor is it deductible by her former husband. Here's the next important rule. 
Child support is always paid before alimony. If a divorce instrument orders payment of, child, uh, of alimony and child support, the child support shall always be considered to have been paid first. If the total child support and alimony payments for the year are less than the amount stipulated in the divorce decree, all payments shall be considered paid towards child support until such support is paid in full, and then any eight remaining amounts will be applied towards the alimony. And if you want to read it for yourself, go to publication 504 and look at page 13. Here's an example of what we mean. John and Jane are divorced. The divorce decree states that John must pay Jane the following monthly amounts, 600 of alimony and 500 of child support. During 2011, John falls behind on his payments. He makes total payments to Jane of $8,000 during the year. Jane will report $2,000 of alimony on a return. The first $6,000 she received was child support and is not includable in her income. So essentially we have 500 times 12 months equals $6,000 of child support. The payments were $8,000. 8 minus 6 is 2, and 2,000 is the alimony that was received. So here is a chart that is out of IRS publications, and it's, it's basically summarizing the rules for alimony and when you have alimony and when you do not. So let's just summarize it here. Payments are alimony if all of the following are true in this left-hand column. That is that the payments are required by a divorce or separation instrument, that the payer and the recipient spouse do not file a joint return with each other, that the payment is in cash, including checks or money orders, that the payment is not designated in the instrument as not being alimony, that the spouse is legally separated under a divorce uh, decree or a separate maintenance decree and are not members of the same household. The payments are not required after death of the recipient's spouse. The payment is not treated as child support. And these payments are deductible by the payer and includable as income by the recipient. In the next column, we have payments that are not alimony if any of the following is true. That the payments are not required by a divorce or separation instrument. You're just making the payment because, well, you're being helpful. That doesn't make it alimony. Payer and recipient spouse file a joint return with each other or the payment is not in cash, and this is a big one. A non-cash property settlement is not alimony. And typically when we get into divorce situations and there's a big fight going on over property, there's going to be a division of that property going on. And a division of a property as the terms of a settlement in a divorce does not create income to one spouse over the other. So that division or paying out uh, in the property is not going to create an alimony payment. It's simply that's how the property is being divided. Also, if the payment is the spouse's part of community income, that is not alimony, or if it is to keep up the payer's property. So let's look at an example of keeping up the payer's property. We've got Jane and John who are, get, are divorced. And while they were married, they bought a house. They're joint owners in this house. And as a condition of the divorce, Jane keeps the house and John has to make all the payments on the mortgage. All right, what happens in a situation like that? Well, Jane is occupying the house, which she 50% owns, and John is making mortgage payments on the house, which he 50% owns. And the way that the rule works is that 50% of the mortgage payment that John makes is alimony to Jane, and she has to include it in her income. And 50% of the payment that John makes is the payment on his own property. John is allowed to claim a deduction on his tax return for mortgage interest and real estate taxes he pays on his house. And Jane will report the half that he paid for her as alimony. And she will, in turn, be able to claim a deduction for the portion of the property, 50% mortgage interest, 50% property taxes on her Schedule A. So it's a, it makes sense. It does make sense. And you can find it actually written in IRS publications. Those are the instructions. Now, payment is designated in the instrument as not being alimony. That clearly would mean it is, well, not alimony. The spouse is legally separated under a degree of divorce or separate maintenance are living together. Then it's not alimony. Or the payments are required after the death of the recipient's spouse, or the payment is treated as child support. If you have a payment that is not alimony, it is not deductible by the payer and is not included as income uh, by the recipient. Next in line, we have gambling winnings. Gambling winnings are taxable. You must include all of your gambling winnings as income on Form 1040, Line 21. 
you will be issued a Form W-2G if you receive any of the following. $1,200 or more in gambling winnings from bingo or slot machines. $1,500 or more in proceeds, the amount of the winnings minus the amount of wager from Keno. More than $5,000 in winnings reduced by the wager or buy-in from a poker tournament, or $600 or more in gambling winnings from pretty much anywhere else, and the payout is at least 300 times the amount of the wager. Any other gambling winnings that are subject to federal tax withholding. Now here's the deal on gambling winnings. Gambling winnings are fully taxable, and you report them on line 21 of your 1040 form. If you have gambling losses, they are deductible to the extent of winnings on Schedule A. And we kind of had a nasty tax situation in our office not that long ago, within the last couple of years, where we had a lady who, you know, she likes to go to the Indian casinos and plug the slot machines, and she finally won the big ticket. Well, you know, she won $50,000 or so. And what happened is that $50,000 win caused all of her Social Security benefits to be exposed to tax. So the maximum amount, 85% of her Social Security benefits became taxable. She had pension income that previously had had almost no tax associated with it that was also getting taxed. And then she went over to Schedule A and she was able to deduct losses that clo closely approximated the $50,000 of wins, but that didn't stop all of those Social Security benefits that otherwise would not have been taxed from still being taxed. So uh, the, it's definitely not an equal offset. Schedule A deductions, <laughs> Schedule A deductions are never uh, a full offset to uh, income being reported on the front of the return. The IRS gets uh, a, gets a bonus in there. Now, your client, if they have taxable gambling winnings, may have received a Form W-2G, and there are typically data entry screens in computer software to enter the information that appears on this document. And of course, the gross winning amount, whatever it is, is the amount that carries to line 21. Next up, we're going to talk about reporting of K-1 income from partnerships, S-corporations, trusts, and estates. These are incredibly common documents. Lots of people come in and get their taxes done who have them. But so many tax preparers are terrified of the documents, confused by the documents, and simply have no idea what to do with them. And this is not a class about how to read K-1s, other than in the most simple form. K-1s can get to be a lot more complicated than we have time for today. So again, if you really want more about the meat of what makes up a K-1 and how income from the K-1 flows to an individual return, we discuss that in two different courses, one of which is rental income and passive activity loss limits. And the other place that we talk about it is in our course called Introduction to S Corporations and LLCs. And in that course, we actually prepare tax returns and create K-1s and show the, the other side, the person who's creating that K-1 and distributing it or issuing it to a recipient. So partnerships and S Corporations in and of themselves are not generally taxed as entities. They don't pay income tax in most cases. Instead, the income gains, losses, and credits from the partnership or S-corporation are passed through to the partners or the shareholders based on their percentage ownership of the company or the, yeah, the company or the corporation. Now, if you are a, partnership in a, a partner in a partnership, you should receive Form 1065-K1, and you report business income deduction and credit amounts shown on Schedule K-1 from the partnership on Form 1040, Line 17, and Schedule E, page 2, or as otherwise instructed. And if you are a shareholder in an S corporation, you will receive a Form 1120S Schedule K-1, and you report the income deduction and credit amounts shown on that K-1 on your Form 1040, Line 17, and on Schedule E, page 2, and as otherwise directed. Estates and trusts are a little bit different. They're substantially different. Even though they also issue a K-1, the rules about when estates and trusts issue K-1s uh, is remarkably different. Estates and trusts can pay income tax directly, so they don't always issue K-1s. And when they do issue K-1s, there can be different, the income flowing through is often of a different type or of a different character than you would just typically see coming through on a K-1 from a partnership or an S corporation. Well, all of the entities are passed through entities, but not all estates and trusts are always passed through. They may or may not be passed through, and again, that's a more advanced tax concept, but if you have a client who did receive a K-1 from an estate or trust, again, you look at the income amounts being reported on each line of the Schedule K-1, and the rule is that income retains its character at all times. 
if the K-1, regardless of whether it comes from an S corporation, partnership, or trust or estate, shows interest income in one of the boxes, it's going to flow through to the interest income line of the 1040. If it shows dividend income, it will flow through to the dividend line. If it shows uh, capital gain income, it will flow through as capital gain income. It will always retain its character. And you would never take interest income and put it on line 17. Because line 17 is not where you enter interest income, is it? It goes on line 8. Character of the income never changes. It always retains character all the way through. Next in line, we're going to talk about canceled debt. If you borrowed money and the debt was canceled, you must generally report the amount of canceled debt as income on your tax return. You can go to publication 4681. Uh, it's an entire publication on canceled debts, foreclosure, repossession, and abandonments. And it provides detailed instructions on the various types of canceled debt and how to calculate the amount of taxable income that applies to different types of canceled debt. Form 1099-C is frequently issued when there is canceled debt. Another document called a 1099-A may also be issued instead of or in addition to a 1099-C. They both effectively do the same thing, which is notify you and the IRS that a debt was canceled. Canceled debt is reported on line 21 of the 1040 form. If you have a canceled debt on your principal residence, the debt may not be taxable, or you may be able to claim an exclusion from reporting that canceled debt as income. This is a temporary law that first came into being in 2007, and they've kept extending it. Now it's extended through 2012, but I haven't heard of any provisions to carry it beyond 2012, so we could be in the final year for it, or it could be extended. We'll just have to see what kind of legislation passes this year. But here are the rules for um, exclusion of canceled debt on your qualified principal residence. When you are claiming an exclusion on your qualified principal residence, you need to file Form 982, Reduction of Tax Attributes Due to Discharge of Indebtedness. This is not a new form. 2007 was not the year they first came out with the form. The form has actually been around for a long time because there are other times that you fill it out. Other reasons why discharged or canceled debt would not be taxed is if you're insolvent or if you're bankrupt or if the discharge debt is related to a business asset, that discharge debt typically reduces your basis in the asset before it triggers income. So 982 is used in a variety of situations, but beginning in 2007, it was adapted to accommodate the exclusion of debt on the sale or um, canceled debt on your primary principal residence. So it, let's look at what it takes in order for debt discharged on a qualified residence to be a qualified discharge of debt that can have income tax not be owed on it. It's kind of a hard way to say it. To be qualified indebtedness, the mortgage you took out must have been used to buy, build, or substantially improve your principal residence, and it must also be secured by your principal residence. The following types of debt secured by your principal residence are also qualifying debt. A refinance of qualified principal residence indebtedness is treated as qualified principal residence indebtedness, but only up to the amount, uh, the amount of the old mortgage just before the refinancing. Also, any additional debt you used to substantially improve your principal residence. So what this is saying is you bought a house at the peak of the market, say, in 2006. And then in 2007, you refinanced and took out more money. So you purchased the house, say, for $500,000, but in that one-year period, the price of the house increased to $100,000. So you took out a home equity line for another $50,000. Well, you're only going to be allowed to exclude the first $500,000 of the mortgage, not the additional fifty, dollars because the additional fifty dollars had nothing to do with the acquisition of the home. Now, if you took out a home equity loan and you used the money to improve the house, then it would also become qualified principal residence indebtedness. So they're looking at when you bought that house, how much of a loan did you take out? If you took out loans subsequent to that original loan, did those loans reap, did they pay off the original loan and give you even more back? Or did they merely pay off the new loan and, you know, say, get you a better interest rate? So they don't want to see the amount of debt being increased and you being able to discharge or exclude from income money that was not used for buying the house or improving the house. 
and lots of people had that when we, the banks were just going crazy. And for years, I had clients coming into me who had income that was nowhere near high enough that I could foresee that they would ever be able to keep up on their mortgage payments, and yet banks kept loaning to them. I'd have a client who earned $35,000 a year, and they had $18,000 of mortgage interest showing up on their 1099 or 1098 documents. It was just feasibly impossible that they'd ever continue to keep up on that. And what they were doing each and every year is they were refinancing using equity in the house to pay off the mortgage, get more cash out, and they were doing it year after year after year until, of course, the whole thing came tumbling down in 2008. So IRS does look at what kind of debt was canceled, and you are only allowed to exclude acquisition debt or home improvement debt that was discharged. Now sometimes people have acquisition debt and home equity debt that was canceled, and you are allowed to exclude the acquisition acquisition debt, but not the equity debt, and the IRS has a formula here to you know, figure out how much you are allowed to exclude. So there is an ordering rule. If the part of your mortgage loan is qualified principal residence indebtedness and the other part is non-qualifying, of course the exclusion applies only to the qualifying part, and here is an example. Your principal residence is secured by a debt of a full million dollars, of which $800,000 is qualified principal residence indebtedness. Your residence just sold for $700,000, and $300,000 of debt is discharged. So you owed a million, the property sold for $700,000, and the difference between what you owed and what it sold for, $300,000, is discharged. This is a short sale. Only $100,000 of the debt discharged can be excluded because your acquisition debt was $800,000, but you owed $1 million. It means $200,000 is non-acquisition and non-qualifying debt. So you're going to be able to exclude 100,000 of 300,000 from your income. Here are the documents which banks use to report canceled debt. And actually, most banks use documents that look exactly like this. Unlike 1099 INTs and 1099 DIVs, um, which almost never look like the forms I showed you earlier, typically when banks do discharge debt, this is what they um, discharge is the wrong word. When they cancel debt, this is what the documents look like that they issue. So this is a 1099A. This is a 1099C. Now there's some other rules relating to cancellation of debt that you should be familiar with. And these are old rules that have been around for a very, very long time. I remember going to an IRS forum in Anaheim back in 1997 and learning about insolvency rules there and how to exclude canceled debt from your income if you could show you were insolvent. So this is definitely not new stuff. And it's a relatively common problem for people to be insolvent and possibly have debt, particularly credit card debt, canceled because they are insolvent. So even if you do not qualify for relief from taxation on discharge of indebtedness under the Mortgage Forgiveness Debt Relief Act of 2007, you may still qualify to exclude forgiven debt from your income if any of the following apply. Number one, you're bankrupt. Debts discharged through bankruptcy are not considered to be taxable income. Number two is insolvency. If you are insolvent when the debt is canceled, some or all of the canceled debt may not be taxable to you. You are insolvent when your total debts are more than the fair market value of your total assets. And IRS, when it looks at that, is really looking at quick sale. If you took all of the assets you had in the world and sold them at a garage sale in a single day or at an auction in a single day to just clear it out and get the most money you could at one time, how much money would you get? Because if the IRS came in and possessed all your stuff, that's how they'd get rid of it. So that's how they value your property. And when you're looking at whether or not you're insolvent, you're looking at how much money do I have in bank accounts, how much money do I have in 401k accounts, how much money do I have um, market value of my property if I were to sell my property quick sale. And if I can show that the, that the value, the quick sale value of all the property owned in the world is $10,000, if I were to hold a garage sale tomorrow or pedal my stuff somewhere tomorrow to get all the cash I could out of it, and I could get $10,000 for it. And then on this side of the equation, I have $30,000 of credit card debt. I'm insolvent to the tune of $20,000. And if my credit card companies cancel $10,000 of credit card debt, that would be a reason to file Form 982 
and claim a, uh, an exception to the taxability of that discharge debt or canceled debt because I'm insolvent. Also, certain farm debts. If you incurred the debt directly in operating a farm more than, and more than half of your income from the prior three years was from farming and the loan was owed to a person or agency regularly engaged in lending, your canceled debt is generally not considered taxable income. So farmers get a break there. Non-recourse loans. A non-recourse loan is a loan for which the lender's only remedy in case of default is to repossess the property being financed or used as collateral. That is, the lender cannot pursue you personally in the case of default. Forgiveness of a non-recourse loan resulting from a foreclosure does not result in cancellation of debt income. However, it may result in other tax consequences. So let's just suppose we have a car loan. You've got someone who purchased a car, and the car is collateral for the loan with no recourse against you if you default on the loan. They can just repossess the car and that's it. Then that would be an example of non-recourse loan and the cancellation of debt associated with that. Gift. If a debt was canceled that was intended as a gift or bequest, you will not have income from canceled debt. But the person who gave you the gift may be required to file a gift return. Qualified real property debt. If you incurred debt secured by real property in connection with a trade or business as described in Chapter 5 of Publication 334, your canceled debt generally is not considered to be taxable income. Now, how do I know if I was insolvent? Well, I've kind of just given you an example of that. Essentially, you add up all of the property you own in the world and figure out what it's worth on a quick sale. And if the, the amount of debt you have is greater than the value of your property, you are insolvent. Of course, this is Form 982. I did a quick fill out of the form, or, or not fill out of the form, but I've got some arrows on here kind of drawing your attention to the lines that matter. 982 looks like it's complicated, but in the end, when you fill it out, it's actually quite simple. On line one, you need to find the box that applies to you. And if you've got discharge of indebtedness on your qualified personal principal residence, you're going to check box 1E. Then on line 2, you enter the amount of debt that's being discharged. And then on line 10B, you, uh, if you continue to own your residence after the discharge, enter on line 10B the amount of qualified principal indebtedness on line 2, because this is going to reduce your basis in the house. Now, I did have this happen this year. It was the most bizarre thing I could ever seen. I have a client who's a dentist. He earns good money. He wasn't insolvent. He wasn't behind on any payments. Wells Fargo just voluntarily volunteered to cancel debt on a second mortgage he had. He didn't apply for it. He didn't ask for it. He didn't even need it. They just did it. They asked him, of course, if he wanted it first, and he said, well, is this a trick question? <laughs> So they canceled the debt. <laughs> and I was scratching my head over this. It's like, you're not insolvent. You weren't forced to sell because you couldn't afford to make payments. You weren't forced to sell because the house was worth less than you paid for it. None of those things applied. They just, out of the blue, canceled $30,000 of debt. There was nothing I could see anywhere that required him to pay tax on that cancellation of debt. It was canceled debt. On, ac on money he b used to purchase or improve his house. So the only thing we had to do was reduce his basis in the home by the amount of canceled debt, obviously in file form 982. So that, I'm still scratching my head over that one. What a good deal. Maybe my comp mortgage company will come up and just volunteer to cancel off my second mortgage. That would be great. OK, the final topic of today's lecture is going to be the foreign earned income exclusion. And this is an exclusion that is claimed on line 21. So it's actually negative income. It's a deduction in a way, but because it's entered on line 21, and we're talking about line 21, other income, I felt that this would be a place to throw it in. This is also a session where we were talking about wage income. And the foreign earned income exclusion is typically tied with wage income. And so I just felt this was a good point in our series to talk about this particular exclusion. So who claims the foreign earned income exclusion? Well, you're entitled to claim this exclusion if you are a US citizen or a resident, and you are outside of the United States living and working in a foreign country for a period of time, typically, that is at least a year, 12 consecutive months or longer. And I'm not going to read all of this bit to you, but I am going to jump down to this paragraph here, which says, 
if you worked and lived outside of the United States for a minimum of 330 full days during a period of 12 consecutive months, you may be able to exclude up to $92,900 of your foreign earnings. And I need to point out that this is earned income only. We're not talking about investment income or rental income or pension income. We're talking about wage income and also self-employment income. If you have earned income while you're living and working overseas and you are outside of the United States for at least 330 days in a 365-day consecutive period of time, you can claim this exclusion. Now the limit of, and the amount that you can claim is adjusted upwards each year for inflation. So last year this number was lower and 20 years ago when I first got into the industry it was closer to $80,000. So it's been checking up each year over time. So what are the requirements to claim the exclusion? To claim the exclusion you must meet all three of the following requirements. Your tax home must be in a foreign country. You must have foreign earned income and you must be either a U.S. citizen who is a bona fide resident of a foreign country or countries for an uninterrupted period that includes an entire tax year, or a U.S. resident alien who is a citizen or national of a country with which the United States has an income tax treaty in effect and who is a bona fide resident of a foreign country or countries for an uninterrupted period that includes an entire tax year, or you are a U.S. citizen or a U.S. resident alien who is physically present in a foreign country or countries for at least 330 days during any period of 12 consecutive months. There is really no exception to that 330 day rule for people who are claiming the physical presence test because the, the foreign earned income exclusion is actually two separate exclusions that you might qualify for. One is the bona fide residence test and the other is the physical presence test. If you don't qualify as a bona fide resident of the foreign country, then the only thing you can qualify for under is the physical presence test. And there's no exception to the physical presence test. Even if your uh, job ends or your health causes you to leave the country you've been living and working in early, IRS says too bad. With one exception, the minimum time requirements for the bona fide resident and the physical presence test can be waived if you leave a foreign country because of war, civil unrest, or similar adverse conditions in that country. So that would affect, of course, a very small number of people. Who can claim the exclusion? Well, if you worked in a foreign country, you may qualify to exclude up to $92,900 of uh, income. If you are filing a joint return and your spouse also worked, your spouse may also be eligible to exclude his or her foreign earned income. To claim the exclusion, you must meet at least one of the following tests, either the bona fide residence test or the physical presence test. Under the bona fide, pre uh, bona fide residence test, you must have established a bona fide resident in that country. You must show the IRS that you have been a bona fide resident of a foreign country or a countries for an uninterrupted period that includes an entire tax year. And the IRS decides whether you are a bona fide resident of a foreign country largely based on the facts that you report on 2555. Well, this year I had a client that I had to scratch my head over and think about a bit because she's a citizen of the United States and she's moved to Canada. And she's in Canada for a five-year period of time working for a university up there. She's maintaining no home inside the United States. And the plan is to return maybe in five years at the end of the contract, but you know the contract could be renewed. She doesn't know. While she's living in Canada, she's in, the can in Canada under a um, temporary resident visa, and she's paying rent and living there and paying Canadian taxes. So is she a bona fide resident of Canada or not? Well, I think that she is. She's got nothing that's really tying her to the United States. She has kind of a quasi, maybe I'm going to come back, maybe I'm not. So why would it matter whether she's a bona fide resident? Well, it matters because we're worried about the number of days she's spending in the country. If she's a, if she's a bona fide resident of Canada, she can make trips to the United States. And usually they're non-working trips. She's coming to visit family. But what happens if she spends one day more than she's supposed to. She's supposed to be physically outside of the United States for 330 out of 365 days, and it turns out she's been here too many days. 
So the bona fide re residence test is something to look at in a situation like that. Now, what if you're definitely not a bona fide resident of the foreign country? You know that you're going there for a year, two years. You're definitely coming back. You're maintaining a home here in the United States while you're away. That's going to be more of a situation where you're really not a bona fide resident of the other country. You know when you're coming back, you're maintaining property here. Um, now you're going to look to see whether you're outside of the country for the full 330 days in a 365-day period. And that physical presence test is really strict. But the IRS says you measure the 330 days out of 365 in any 12-month consecutive period. But the 12-month period does not need to be in the same year. So this is actually a figure from the IRS instructions for Form 2555. And they're essentially saying that the 12 consecutive months can straddle two years. So the first 12 months could start in January 2010 and end in December 2010, but they could also start in September 2010 and end August of 2011. Either of these two situations is a 12 consecutive month period and is allowed. You can count days you spent abroad for any reason. You do not have to be in a foreign country only for employment purposes. You can be on vacation. But of course, the only income you can exclude is foreign earned income. So can I claim either the exclusion or the deduction? Well, let's start here. This is another table out of the instructions. Do you have foreign earned income? Yes. Is your tax home in a foreign country? Yes. Are you a US citizen? Yes. Were you a bona fide resident of a foreign country or countries for an uninterrupted period that includes an entire tax year? If the answer is yes, you can claim the foreign earned income exclusion. If the answer is no, I'm not a bona fide resident, then we look at were you physically present in a foreign country or countries for at least 330 full days during any 12-month period? So those are the tests being applied in a chart. So in summary, you can claim the foreign income exclusion, or to claim it, you must meet the bona fide resident test or the physical present test. You must have earned income from wages or self-employment, and you must be a US citizen or resident alien. How do you claim the exclusion? Will you complete Form 2555 or 2555EZ and attach it to your tax return? And I should tell you before we look at this illustration that the foreign earned income exclusion cannot be claimed by employees of the federal government. So if you are a US government employee and you are stationed overseas, you're not eligible for this exclusion. So we just canceled out all of our military people, all of our civil servants who are working overseas. <laughs> OK, um, here's our illustration. Aussie Sunshine is a US citizen who moved to Perth, Australia on June 30, 2011. He began working at Down Under University as a professor. And he had $50,000 of income earned inside of the United States and $50,000 earned in Australia. Since Aussie was outside of the United States for less than a full year, he needs to prorate his exclusion based on the number of days he resided outside of the United States, and he calculates his earned income exclusion as follows. He begins with the maximum amount of income that can be excluded in a 12-month period, which is 92,900. He then determines the percentage of the exclusion that he can claim. The days of physical presence outside of the United States is 184 out of 365, 50.4% of the year, which means his exclusion will be 50 0.4% of 92,900. That's the most he can exclude. We determine the amount of foreign earned income, which was $50,000. And we claim the lesser of Aussie's foreign earned income or the allowable exclusion multiplied by the percentage of the year that Aussie was outside of the United States. So we're going to go and multiply 92,000 by 50.4%, and we get the 46,822. So that's the amount of the exclusion. And it gets entered on Form 1040, line 21. And here is the 1040. On Form 1040, we enter $100,000 of wage income. $50,000 was earned inside of the United States while he was a resident here. And $50,000 was earned after he moved to Perth, Australia. And so we see that we've got FEC, meaning Foreign Earned Compensation, $50,000. So 50 plus 50 is the 100. We then move down to line 21, and we enter Form 2555EZ. We enter the amount of the exclusion in brackets next to the form description, and then carry that negative number over to line 21, and we get $53,178.
He also needs to uh, attach form 2555 to his return. And in this case, I gave you 2555EZ. We're not uh, claiming the um, foreign housing exclusion to try and keep it simple. And so we enter the date that he begins the physical presence test. It's continuing on. He has, he's met the test by the time he files, but for the, it began during the year and continues after the year. And we enter his address, his employer. This section here is a little bit confusing. It says days present in the United States, but it does not want you to enter days present in the United States before the exclusion period begins or after it ends. It only wants you to enter days in the United States while you're, for the period of time, you are residing overseas. So he resided in the United States up until he went to Perth, but he didn't come to the United States after he began residing in Perth. So this area is actually left blank. Here in part four, we enter $92,900. We enter the number of days he was outside of the country. We divide that into 100, uh, 365 days, or we divide 365 into 184, and we get the percentage, 0.504. We multiply that by the 92,900 and we get 46822. Um, so then we get the lesser of 46822 or the actual amount of foreign earned compensation that he had, and there's his exclusion. The final table in here has to do with identifying forms of taxable and non-taxable income. Um, let's take a look at some of the types of income that people will get that is considered to be non-taxable. It includes welfare benefits, food stamps, workers' compensation, disaster relief grants made under the Disaster Relief Act of 1974, cash rebate on an item that you buy from a dealer or manufacturer, mortgage assistance payments, the national uh, mortgage assistance payments you get under Section 235 of the National Housing Act are not taxable, campaign contributions actually spent for campaign purposes, casualty insurance and other reimbursements, child support payments, Court awards and damages for personal injury or distress related to such injury. Court awarded damages are actually reasonably common. I have clients come in with these every tax season, and it is a challenge to determine whether or not it's a taxable court award or a non-taxable court award. Essentially, if the award is for physical injury or emotional distress caused by the injury, it's not taxable. But if it's compensation for damages to property or to lost wages, then it will be taxed. Energy conservation subsidies paid by public utilities for the purchase or installation of an energy conservation device in a dwelling are not taxable. Foster care payments you receive for the care of children under age 19 that are placed with you by a government agency or a tax-exempt child placement agency also are not taxable and difficulty of care payments you receive for the care of five or fewer individuals under the age of 19 are not taxable, nor are gifts and inheritance. Indian fishing rights in place on 317.88. I actually have a client who every year gets these Indian fishing rights income or income from Indian fisheries, and it's not taxable. Uh, job interview expenses paid by a prospective employer interest on qualified savings bond you redeem and pay for qualified higher educational expenses in the same year, the sale of personal property you sell at a loss, but the loss is not deductible, scholarships and fellowships used to pay for tuition fees and books, VA payments paid by the Department of Veterans Affairs, utility rebates that reduce the purchase price of electricity, and money you borrow and are required to repay. None of those are income. They're all non-taxable income. On the next column, we do have income that is taxable. It includes Alaska permanent dividends, activities that are not for profit, such as hobby income. Hobby income is taxable, and it is reported on line 21. Alimony is taxable, as are court awards and damages for lost wages or profits, punitive damages, settlement of pension rights, patent or copyright infringements, breach of contract, back pay, or damages relating to emotional distress from civil rights violations. And I've had clients come into me over the years with all of these types of payments for court awards. Credit card or insurance payments, jury pay, estate and trust income distributed or required to be distributed to you. These typically appear on a K-1. Bribes are taxable. You bribe a public official to get what you need, that public official is supposed to report the bribe as income. Rents received for use of personal property. 
net business expense, uh, net business income after expenses, fees for services you perform as a corporate director, executor, or administrator of an estate, foster care payments you receive from a government or tax-exempt child placement agency if you care for more than five individuals who are age 19 or older and difficulty of care payments you receive for the care of more than 10 qualified foster individuals under age 19 or more than five individuals age 19 or older, payments for maintaining space in your home to care for foster individuals, gambling winnings, illegal income, prizes, awards, free tours, the sale of personal property you sell at a profit, scholarships used to pay for room and board, strike and lockout benefits, and cancel debt other than uh, debt by gift or bequest. Okay, so that is it. Whew. Session four, password number three is Roan, R-O-A-N. And that concludes uh, this session on wage investment and other investment and other income. Thank you for attending class. It is now time to complete the session four classwork assignment. There are actually three classwork assignments to work on as a part of session four today. And the first classwork assignment is shown on page 29 of your student manual. So please flip to that page. You will see that question, uh, you'll see that classwork assignment number one is just a series of questions. Identify which of the following are subject to federal income tax. And I've got a list here, A through O. Please push pause on video playback at this point. Think through each of these items and determine which one is subject to federal income tax. In other words, must be included in your income on your tax return. Uh, when you are finished answering classwork number one, please resume video playback for a review of the classwork one answer key. I now have the classwork one for session four answer key up in front of you. The taxability of each of the federal items is as follows. State lotto winnings, yes, those are taxable. Bribes also are taxable. Income from illegal activities, hmm, also taxable. Child support, non-taxable. Child support is one that comes up a lot. The non-custodial parent is not allowed to claim a deduction for child support paid, and the custodial parent does not have to report income received from child support. E, spousal support under a divorce decree, yes, that is fully taxable. It is also deductible to the spouse paying out. F, prize of a free trip is taxable. Veterans benefits, these are not taxable, but please do not con confuse the concept of a veteran's benefit, which is usually a form of disability payment, with a veteran's pension. A pension is fully taxable as pension income. Tips not reported to employer, those also are taxable. We certainly learned all about that when we learned about completing Form 4137 in Session 3. A tip of less than $10 Yes, that's taxable, and lots of people get thrown off by that. They think, oh, well, because the tip uh, is under $20 in a month, I don't have to report it and pay tax on it at all. That's not the way the wording of the rules is. The rules say that all income is reportable and is subject to income tax. But if you receive tips that are $20 or less, or less than $20 of tips in any one month from any one employer, you don't have to pay the tip tax on them, but you still have to pay income tax. What that means is that the tip would be reported on line seven as wages, but you wouldn't need to also complete form 4137 to figure the amount of tip tax owed on, in this case, that $10 of income. Gross hobby income is taxable. Interest on a federal bond is taxable. But at the federal level, interest on a state bond is not taxable. Meals supplied by and for the convenience of the employer are generally not taxable if they meet certain requirements. Severance pay is taxable. And a canceled debt that is not a gift is also taxable. So we cover many of these in today's class, but some of them we will take another look at later in the course as well. So that concludes the review of the Classwork 1 answer key. Let's take a look at the next Classwork assignment in line for today. That's Classwork number 2. David Lerner is single and lives with his son James Lerner. 
James is a senior in high school. David's ex-wife pays him $4,800 a month spousal support and $400 a month child support for James. David pays more than half the cost of maintaining his household. David was unemployed from January through March and received a 1099G that you see right here. David worked for Jones Electric as an electrician. His W-2 is attached to complete his federal tax return. So we have his 1099-G showing $4,375 of unemployment received for the year. On the next page, we have his W-2 from Jones Electric. It shows the gross wages paid. At this point, please push pause on video playback. Complete classwork assignment number two for session four. When you are finished with preparation of this return, please resume video playback for a review of the answer key. And I now have the classwork two for session four answer key up on the screen in front of you. At this point, you should have actually worked through this problem by hand on tax forms. That is absolutely always the best way to learn. So I'm hoping that you did that and that you really did think about this problem and haven't just listened through to see the answer. You don't learn much when all you do is listen to the answer. You learn a lot more when you do it. But if you did do it, this is what hopefully you came close to. James kept up a home for his son all year and qualifies for the head of household filing status. David Lerner lives with his son James Lerner. James is a senior in high school. He's got a dependent there. So he's going to be head of household with his dependent son qualifying him. James, however, is age 17. If you look at his date of birth, he was born in 1994. 2001 minus 94, 1994 is going to give you 17. He, James must be under age 17 to qualify for the child tax credit. So David has a qualifying child for purposes of dependency and for head of household filing status, but he does not have a qualifying child for purposes of the child tax credit. David will report the $35,000 of wage income he received, and that's showing on his W-2 in box 1. He will report that on line 7 of his Form 1040. He's also going to report $4,800 in alimony that he received from his ex-wife for the year. David's ex-wife pays him $400 a month in spousal support, $400 a month in child support. The child support is not taxable at all to David, but the $400 per month in alimony is. He will report that as alimony income on line 11 of his 1040. David received $4,375 in unemployment compensation right here. That will be entered on line 19 of his Form 1040. Let's go take a look at the finished 1040. David Lerner, the filing status is 4 for head of household. He claims an exemption for himself. He enters his son, James Lerner. He does not check the child tax credit box. James is too old. He enters an exemption for himself, an exemption for James. Total exemptions on line 6D is 2. Next in line, we enter the wages reported on line 7 of the W-2. Line 11, we enter $4,800 of alimony. Line 19, we enter $4,375 of unemployment compensation. That leaves total income for the year at $44,175. Adjusted gross income is the same as total income. We move over to page three, or we move over to page two of the 1040. AGI carries to line 38, and then on line 40, this time we will select the head of household standard deduction. $8,500 is entered on line 40. On line 41, we subtract 8,500 from line 38. We get 35,675, and on line 42, we enter two times 3,700 dollars. That's $7,400. We subtract $7,400 from the total on line 41, and we get taxable income of $28,275. We go to the tax tables, look up the tax based on head of household filing status, and we get $3,634. Now, David only had $2,500 of federal tax withheld, so he will owe $1,134 with this return. So that concludes the review of the Session 2 Classwork Answer Key. Let's go back to 
to the session four manual and take a look at session four, classwork number three. And this assignment involves Jerry Maguire. He is a server. He paid his ex-wife, Dorothy, um, child support and alimony. And according to the divorce decree, Jerry must pay Dorothy $400 per month spousal support and $800 a month of child support. During the year, Jerry made payments to Dorothy totaling $13,200. At the end of the year, Jerry was behind on support and still owed her an additional $1,200. So your job is going to be to determine how much of the payments received was alimony, how much was received that was child support, and enter the total amount that is allowed as a deduction on the return. Jerry was lucky this year. He won a free trip to Mexico valued at $3,500. He also won $600 in the Washington State Lottery. In addition to receiving a 1099 INT from Ducks Bank and a 1099 DIV from Cleats Inc., Jerry had income as follows. He had Port of Portland bond interest in the amount of $1,000 and Port of Seattle bond interest in the amount of $500. Jerry received quite a few large tips during the year and did not report all of them to his employer. He was very naughty. He cannot verify nor dispute the allocation in Box 8 on his W-2. Jerry also received a K-1 showing his share of income from Gridirons, Inc., an S corporation in which he is an active participant. Jerry's W-2 and K-1 are attached to prepare his federal tax return. Well, here we are. We've got a W-2 showing $25,000 of wage income and $5,000 of allocated tips. Then we go over and we have a 1099 INT from Ducks Bank showing interest income. We have a 1099 DIV from Cleats Inc. also showing dividend income. And here is the Schedule K-1. The Schedule K-1 shows ordinary income of $1,600, interest income of $1,000, and a Section 179 deduction of $400. It is your job to prepare Jerry's tax return. The forms you will need to prepare to do Jerry's tax return correctly are Form 1040, Schedule B, Schedule E, page 2, Form 4137, and Form 4562. Oh my gosh, that looks like a lot of work. Do the best job you can by pushing pause on video playback, printing out these forms, and muddling through them as best you can when you've done, the, when you've done your very best and you're ready to give up, uh, or you think you're done, whichever comes first. Please resume video playback for a review of the Classwork 3 answer key. And I have the Session 4 Classwork 3 answer key up on the screen in front of you now. Jerry's W-2 shows that he received $25,000 in wages, and he also had tips included in Box 1, but he has unreported tips that are not included in Box 1 of $5,000. So right off the bat, we know he's going to have at least $30,000 of wage income carrying to Line 7 of his Form 1040. He's also going to have to complete that form 4137 to figure out the amount of tip tax he will owe on the allocated tip amount of uh, $5,000. So on line 7 of his form 1040, we will enter $30,000 of wage income. On the side of interest income, Jerry received tax-exempt interest. He also received ordinary uh, interest and bond interest. And the total amount of interest that he received for the year is shown right here. He's got box one interest of thirteen hundred, box three interest of two hundred and fifty. When we add those up, it's more than fifteen hundred dollars. Therefore, Schedule B is required. Now he also received um, tax exempt interest. The Port of Seattle bond and the Port of Portland bond interest are tax exempt interest. Those will be reported on line eight B of his Form ten forty. They do not get reported on Schedule B, however. Since Jerry received a Schedule K-1, it is likely that he's going to have an entry on line 17 of his Form 1040. But to figure out what that is, we're really going to need to do Schedule E first. And in order to come up with an accurate total for Schedule E, we're also going to have to complete Form 4562. So that's really a rather nasty form to throw at you this early in the course. And we're not going to have much of a lecture on how to prepare it at all. We really haven't had a lecture on how to prepare it. But we will spend uh, two classes covering Form 4562 later on in our course when we get into depreciation, because that actually is the form used for depreciation. 
The next item in line is miscellaneous income. Miscellaneous income is reported on line 21 of Form 1040. Gambling winnings and prizes are both forms of income reported on Form 1040, line 21. And since more than one type of income is reported on line 21, Jerry should include a statement detailing the income that is reported on the line. So in other words, IRS provides a line, but uh, if you have more than one item to report on the line, they actually want you to attach in a statement so that, that the statement can describe what the different types of income are and the amount of income on line 21 that is allocable to each of the different types of income. So ultimately, what are we putting on line 21? Well, we have a fair market value on the prize of 3,500. We have lotto winnings of $600. So the total amount to report on that line is 4,100. And the statement should say something along the lines of prize 3,500 and lotto 600. Adjustments to income, he does get a deduction for the amount of alimony he paid, but the child support is considered paid first. And the total amount of payments Jerry made during the year is $13,200. He needs to pay the child support first, and $800 a month is allocable to child support. And 800 times 12 is $9,600. So we'll subtract $9,600 from $13,200 that he actually did pay. That leaves $3,600 that he will be able to deduct as alimony paid. Here is Jerry's finished tax return. Jerry McGuire is a single filer. He claims an exemption for himself only. He gets nothing for his children that he paid child support on. His wage plus allocated tip income is entered on line seven and totals $30,000. He has to prepare a Schedule B to show the amount of interest income to include on line 8A. And he also has $500 of dividend income. The tax-exempt interest is reported on line 8B. So let's take a look at that Schedule B together. Schedule B shows Ducks Bank paying $1,550 of interest income, and Gridirons Inc., the K-1, is where that mystery amount of $1,000 came from. So earlier when I was reviewing the, the assignment with you, I said that we've got a 1099-INT showing 1300 of ordinary interest and 215 of U.S. bond interest. That's where the 1550 comes from. But when it comes to interest income, we also have to look at that K-1. And when we look at K-1 income, that income retains its character. So the $1,000 of interest income showing on line 4 of the Schedule K-1 will also carry over to the Schedule B and is entered on line 1. We subtotal line one at 2,550, and that carries to line two. Since we are already completing Schedule B for the interest, we'll also slap the Cleats Inc. 1099 dividend income on there. That's $500. So ultimately, on line four, we have $2,550 that will carry to line 8A of the Form 1040, and we have $500 of dividend income that will carry to line 9A of Form 1040. And here we are, line 8A, 2,500, line 8B, 1,500, because that includes the Port of Seattle and the Port of Portland bond interest. Let's not forget those. Right here, 1,000 plus 500 is 1,500. That goes on line 8B. Next in line, we have the amount to enter on line 17. That totals $1,200. And mentally, I know in my head where that came from. I'll show you real quick. See, here we have the K-1, and the K-1 shows ordinary business income of $1,600, and down below is a Section 179 deduction of $400. The purpose of the Form 4562 is to determine whether that $400 deduction will be allowed, and it is allowed after you work out the form. But ultimately, just mentally, I know that this deduction is going to come off this number right here. So 400 from 1600 leaves us with $1,200, and $1,200 is the amount of income to report on line 17. We already determined where the income on line 21 came from. That was prize and lotto wins. And then on line 31A, we're going to enter alimony paid and the recipient's Social Security number. The deduction that we determined is $3,600. That comes off of the total income and leaves Jerry with adjusted gross income of $34,750. 
We carry that adjusted gross income amount to the top of page two, line 38. The next stage is to figure the standard deduction for a single filer, that's $5,800. That's what Jerry will enter on line 40. We subtract 40 from 38 and get 28,950. The only exemption Jerry gets is his own, so we enter $3,700 on line 32, and we subtract that from line 41. That leaves Jerry with taxable income of $25,250. It's now time to go to the tax rate schedules in Pub 17 and look up the tax. If you do, you should come up with $3,366. Next step is to figure the additional tax that Jerry owes on the $5,000 of unreported tips. He's going to complete Form 4137 next. And here is Form 4137. We enter the name of the employer, the employer identification number, the amount of charge tips received for the year. And we look at the W-2, we can see wages received is 25,000, tips received and included in box one is 10, and additional tips that have been allocated not included in box seven is $5,000. So five plus 10 is the 15, we'll enter in column C. The total amount that was actually reported is 10, and that leaves $5,000 being subjected to the tax. We again see that the $25,000 reported on line seven or the $25,000 that is shown in box one that has been subjected to social security tax is far less than the threshold amount of $106,800. That means all 5,000 is subject to social security tax. We're gonna multiply 5,000 by 0 0.042, we get 210. 5,000 times 0 0.0145 is 73. The total is $283. And we enter 283 on line 57 of the Form 1040. We add up line 59 and line 57. We get total tax of 3649. Jerry's W-2 shows he had 3500 withheld. That leaves him with a balance due of $149. And the final form I need to show you for the Session 3 Classwork Assignment is Form 4562. This is really rather nasty to throw it at you through so early in the course. Uh, we will, I promise, cover it in great detail, two full sessions devoted to this form later on after the midterm exam. Uh, but essentially, on Form 4562, we have to figure or calculate the um, allowable amount of Section 179 deduction that uh, Jerry can claim. So he enters the amount of the deduction carrying from the K-1. Uh, there's some computations that go on just by following the line instructions for this particular form. In the end, the deduction is allowed in full. And it carries to Schedule E, page two. And on Schedule E, page two, we enter the payor shown or the company shown on the Schedule K-1, that's Gridiron Inc. Gridiron is an S corporation, so we enter code S in column B and the employer identification number for grid irons is entered in column D. There is a question up here that says, are you reporting any loss not allowed in a prior year? The answer is no, so we check no. We then look to line A, where we enter amounts of income and loss, and the income has to be defined as passive or non-passive. Jerry is an active participant in the S corporation, so his income is non-passive and we enter $400 of Section 179 expense in the column where it asks for that. We enter the non-passive income from that same activity, which is $1,600. We subtract the 1600 or the 400 from the 1600 and we're left with $1,200, and that $1,200 does carry to line 17 and is entered right there. So that concludes the review of the Session 4 Classwork 3 Answer Key. I promise you that the homework assignment will not be quite as complex. They're not going to throw a 4562 at you. And moving back to our manual, let's take a look at the homework assignment that you need to complete before I see you again at the beginning of Session 5. Sally Price is an office manager. Her ex-husband paid her $500 a month in alimony. Sally's 10-year-old niece, Mary Tate, lived with her for 10 months, and Sally provided more than half the cost of her support. Sally received $30 of jury pay and $15 of interest on her savings account. 
Sally also received a K-1 that is attached from a real estate partnership she is invested in. Her W-2 is attached. Prepare her return. You'll need to prepare Form 1040, Schedule B, and Schedule E, page 2. And we will see that the income being reported on here is rental income. That will be reported on Schedule E in the passive income section. And she also has some investment income showing on this particular Schedule K-1. So this concludes Session 4 of the Basic Tax Course. Have fun completing the Session 4 homework assignment, and I will see you again back at the beginning of Session 5. We will begin Session 5 with a review of the Session 3 quiz answer key, and then we will move on and review Sally Price's tax return together. Thank you, and bye-bye.